the next uh, cranial nerve is the fifth cranial nerve, or the trigeminal nerve. It has three branches, from above down, the ophthalmic, the maxillary, and the mandibular. The nuclei for the fifth nerve are rather complicated. There are about four, there are four nuclei, which run throughout the brain stem and even dip into the upper cervical cord. Without getting too complicated about it, the essence is that the vast majority are in around the pontine area. Now, you can read up further about the, deep, the uh, nuances of it, if you like, but I'm going to approach it from a clinical perspective here. So the fifth nerve, as we'll see later with the seventh nerve, has three main components in terms of clinical testing. And they are the motor part, the sensory part, and the reflexive part. The motor part is to muscles of mastication, how you chew. And simply done, you ask the patient to grit their teeth. So can you grit your teeth, please? And you feel the muscle bulk of temporalis and of masseter there. Then you, you test the pterygoids by asking the patient to gently open their mouth and ask them to push against my hand. Push down and then to one side with your jaw to me and then against me. Perfect. So they're the muscles of mastication. The second part is the sensory part. And this clinically uh, tends to come into play a lot more than the motor part in my experience. And the three branches are the ophthalmic, the maxillary, and the mandibular. And it's very important because a lot of people get facial numbness and it's non-specific and you're trying to chase it down. But if you know the anatomy fairly well, you'll be able to discern whether it's congruous with the trigeminal nerve problem or incongruous. The best way to start, as with all sensory exams, is to say, start with soft touch. So every time you do a sensory exam, you must check at the top of the sternum and say, this is soft touch. Once the patient then knows what you're talking about, you can proceed. So I'm going to examine your face by stroking with this cotton wool, with the, and I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. Okay, so if you close your eyes, I'm going to touch you on your forehead. And I'll ask, can you feel that? Yep. And then I'll go to the opposite side. Can you feel that? Does it feel the same on the left as the right? Yes. And is there any change as I come across? No. Great. Now, sometimes people are a little anxious, and they feel they've got numbness on their face. And they say, my whole face is numb. And the trigeminal nerve goes back way beyond the hairline. The point is, the posterior uh, part of it is here, right at the vertex. So if someone says, I've got a numbness here, a numbness here, and then you hit the hairline, and they say, no, it's normal now, well, then you have to say there may be an underlying anxiety element here. It's only if you go back here, and then it becomes normal back here, would you say, yes, there's definitely V1, or uh, the first branch of the trigeminal nerve is involved. The back of the head here is C2 the first cervical uh, sensory dermatome, as there is no C1. So we check the V1 is the ophthalmic branch once more. V2 is down to the cheek. Can you feel that there? And feel that there? And V3 is the mandibular branch, which is down here and down here. They feel the same on both sides? Yeah. Similarly with the uh, V3, the posterior limit of, of it is the angle of the jaw. So you go back here, and hopefully it'll become normal again here as we get into cervical dermatomes. Um, so they're the sensory element of it, and you can do it both with um, soft touch, as I've just done, and with uh, pin prick. You don't do it with vibration sense uh, in, in, in this uh, nerve. And the pin prick, again, is checked for the sternum. I use a cocktail stick. And in a similar vein, you say, that's a little sharp there. Don't let me hurt you, I hope. And sharp there. And that feels the same on both sides? OK, so that's the sensory part. So you've got the motor part for the muscles of mastication and the sensory part. The sensory part usually gets dam damaged. Uh, in young people, we worry about MS, whether there's an MS plaque in the brain stem. Another option is, uh, another common uh, reason for uh, destruction of a fifth nerve is um, Sjogren's syndrome, which you get dry eyes and dry mouth. And so if you're stuck for causes and it's an isolated fifth nerve, think about Sjogren's. But MS would usually be the first one would, one would worry about. However, in, older, in an older population, the commonest time the trigeminal nerve comes into play is neuralgia. What everyone refers to as neuralgia, when the wind changes or when they wash their teeth, they get a sudden sharp, it's called lancinating, which is a stabbing pain, down one or two parts of the nerve. The last part of examination of the trigeminal nerve uh, are the reflexes that I mentioned before. Now, this is usually done in the intensive care situation, so you don't particularly need to do it in practice unless someone has, a, a, unless there's a very good reason, really. But just to, to demonstrate how it is done is, is important. So in a, a patient who's fully conscious, like Donica, I'd ask him to look up and to the left, high as you can, up to the left. Now I'm trying to separate the eyelashes as much as possible. I make, a, with a clean bit of cotton wool, I make a pointer here, 
and I'm coming in from the side, not touching eyelashes, and as you'll remember, the sclera is white. So we're not touching the sclera, it's the corneal reflex we're looking for. So I'm going to touch very gently, sorry, Danica. Sorry, it's not a pleasant thing to do. Very gently over the cornea, and as you saw, sorry again, they, both eyelids blink. In a Bell's palsy, the efferent branch on the left-hand side is damaged, the seventh nerve. So, for example, if Dunnock had a left Bell's palsy and I was to do the corneal reflex on the right, what I'd expect is both eyelids to blink normally. If he had a left-sided Bell's palsy, however, the brainstem is allergic to the fact there's something on the cornea, but on it, the, the right side will blink, but the left side cannot do so because the orbicularis oculi, oculus on that side is damaged because of that Bell's palsy. So that really is the fifth cranial nerve, except for in extremists and the difference between trying to tell the difference between in extreme situations, trying to tell the difference between a bulbar and a pseudobulbar palsy, one sometimes does the jaw jerk. It's the second reflex attached to the fifth nerve, and it's rather simply done. So I ask the patient to open their mouth fully, well fully, and then close it halfway and hold it there. So I put my index finger here. Patients get very frightened about this, so reassure, I'm going to be, I'll try and be gentle, and you give a good whack. Okay. Just do it the once or twice. That's normal. The vast majority of times it's normal. Only if you see it being highly exaggerated would I overcall it. I would not uh, call a, jaw, uh, a positive jaw jerk um, unless it was really obvious and it was in the context of other signs. The presence of a jaw jerk helps distinguish between a pseudobulbar or upper motor neuron lesion of the lower cranial nerves, 9, 10, 11, 12, versus a bulbar palsy or a lower motor neuron lesion of the lower cranial nerves, 9, 10, 11, 12. We'll discuss that later on when we come to those specific nuclei.